Welcome back, everyone, on this Saturday morning. Steve Cashel, Dr. Brian Cole. It is Sports Medicine Weekly. Wrapping up this Saturday, coming up next, it's Inside the Clubhouse with Bruce Levine here around 670 The Score. But Dr. Cole, got a great final segment here to wrap up this Saturday's show. I know we had a tremendous uh, success once again with the Chicago Sports Summit. Thanks so much for allowing me to be part of it. I had such a great time on my panel, which included... Mike and Kim Adamley, we're going to speak to them in just a, a moment. Matt, Matt Forte, former Chicago Bear, was with us as well. And um, also we had uh, Jack O'Callaghan, who played yeah. on that uh, 1980 Miracle on Ice Olympic hockey team that beat the Soviet Union. It was so much fun. But back to Wednesday, yeah. October 3rd, Chicago yeah. Sports Summit. Was the third annual? Third time. And, and to me, this one felt like the best. I, I've liked each and every one of them, to be honest. But And we always learned something from the one before. I thought the Me Too panel was amazing. I was just super impressed by some of those women athletes, the, their, their comments, their, uh, their understanding of the issues that happen for, you know, in terms of gender identity, gender differences in sports. That was a great panel. Uh, but clearly the last panel with uh, Mike and Kim was our really the best panel. I continue to get emails from people saying they love the event and they especially love the last panel just because – it was such a frank, uh, understandable presentation of something that's really in the news. It's been in the news for a, some time now, and they did an amazing job presenting it. So I, I, I walked out of there. I said that was a great morning, and that was a great way to end the morning. It was perfect. It was, again, 7.30 at start. Everybody was done by 11.30 noon. Yeah. And, it's uh, a lot of value. And, yeah. and on top of it, you know, we, we raised almost $100,000 for uh, Girls in the Game, for uh, After School Matters, and for uh, Sports Medicine Research at Rush. So... Look, it's great to have a philanthropy, but it's not like your standard philanthropy event because people got so much value. Well, let's bring on Mike Adamley, former Northwestern running back and also former Chicago Bear, and his wife, Kim. Kim, uh, such an integral part of uh, Mike's life, uh, obviously, for such a long time and um, really helping Mike uh, through these uh, difficult days, suffering from uh, CTE or the current uh, current treatments right now, as we talk, uh, Doctor Cole, about CTE. I guess no one alive has been diagnosed with CTE, but um, no, this has always been a condition that uh, we call post mortem. I mean, it's not something they've really figured out how to do it while people are alive yet suffering from th- that problem and the progression of it. So let's bring on Mike and Kim. Thanks so much for joining us here on Sports Medicine Weekly. And uh, can we begin with uh, what uh, is CTE? Can we tell our listeners, for those who may not be uh, familiar with it? Well, first of all, uh, on behalf of my wife, we appreciate you having us on here because it's really important in our eyes. Um, CTE and uh, took me a little while to keep, I had to keep saying this over and over again to get the full meaning of the word chronic traumatic encephalopathy. It didn't come easy, but uh, like a lot of football players, uh, we all saw the movie Concussion. And when I heard about this, uh, to be honest with you, it it scared the heck out of me. But then uh, I went to have um, a routine checkup for something else that I uh, have. I had epilepsy and still do. And I went in for just a checkup. And uh, I was found out I had something. The doctor said I was also had something concurrent with uh, CT. And I said, well, how can that be? Because, you know, we're not able to find that out until, uh, you know, aut- autopsy. So that's that's how I found out. Mike, did oh. you did you I'm sorry, I didn't I didn't mean to interrupt. I'm just curious. Did you were you having perceptible issues of memory or recall? And so they said, look, we've got to get this checked out. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, I was on the air and uh, I was doing a sportscast, and I, you know, I felt myself doing the Ralph Cramden humana 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 humana, and <laughs> forgetting, uh, you know, taking a couple seconds to say thank you from our, you know, Rob Stafford and Allison Rosati, and I said, oh, you know what, I got to do something. It's interesting. Just I have to imagine just even recognizing and saying, look, I could just try harder or do something else, and then saying, look, I've got, there's an issue here, and I've got to get this checked out. So there was an objective test that was done that said, look, you've got CTE, and then the ball starts rolling. We're going to learn about this, figure it out, and figure out how to optimize and make the best out of the situation. Was that kind of how it all unfolded, and when did this happen? Well, no, it's not. It wasn't quite that that clear. The, the, the 
tricky thing about CTE, um, especially when Mike first started manifesting symptoms, is they really didn't know what was going on. Um, that incident that Mike talked about uh, where he was first diagnosed with epilepsy was in January of 1999. And uh, he went, they did a three day hospital stay, complete neurological workup, and they found a lesion on his inner temporal um, uh, hemisphere of his brain that they attributed to football, and that was causing the epilepsy. So we were fortunate in that Mike had been followed by neurologists since that time. And it was about in the mid-2000s, about 2004, that Mike was starting to show signs. He was he was uh, starting to have be a little bit erratic in his on-air performance, you know, as he mentioned. And, um, and then um, the thing about CTE, it's, it's a degenerative disease, and it's caused by repetitive blows to the head. They used to think it was concussions, but what they know now from research, it just says repetitive blows to the brain, like in football or hockey or, or many sports. And what happens is that, that the, the brain bashes against the skull. It breaks the cell structure. And the tau proteins are released, and they're sticky, and they tangle up. And then they, and any other cells they touch, they kill. So what happens is that over time, even without further blows to the head, the damage is ongoing. So it isn't until like 10 or 15 years, usually after a a person stops playing sports, that they start to manifest the symptoms. And the first symptoms are not the memory. The first symptoms are um, mood changes and aggression and paranoia and impulsivity and, um, uh, then it starts to go into the memory and the slow processing and eventually to the point of dementia. And so Mike wasn't diagnosed um, definitively. He's been followed for a long time, but it was in January of 2016. They put him back in the hospital for another three-day evaluation because he's having seizures again. And the doctor, after the workup, um, His neurologist said, Mike, you have all the symptoms that we know to be concurrent with CTE. Visiting with Kim and Mike Adamley. Mike, of course, the former Northwestern and Bears running back and former NBC5 sports anchor. I'm Steve Cashel with Dr. Brian Cole. This is Sports Medicine Weekly. And Kim and Mike telling their story of Mike uh, and his, right now, diagnosis of dementia and probable CTE courageously vowing to uh, set the example of someone continuing to live their best life despite the symptoms of the disease. And um, you also have uh, formed a uh, joint initiative, haven't you, Kim and Mike? Uh, One of you, uh, please tell us about that, the Concussion Legacy Foundation. Uh, Well, one of the things that happened when... uh they first wrote, did this story on us was uh, the number of players that were sort of, you know, uh, in the same boat I was. And we wound up sort of being a, uh, I got all kinds of calls from all kinds of people from Joe Namath to uh, Phyllis Stram, who was uh, Hank Stram's wife. And it, uh, had so many people had, had read the story. So uh, one thing that we do know is that, you know, if, if you stay together and you keep, you know, reaching out and touching other people, you know, uh, I have about five, six, ten guys we go to each other when we get down in the dumps and whatever, and we all agree that, you know, uh, don't worry, there's something, somebody always here to make sure that uh, the, the worst didn't happen. And that's that's what caused us to 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 form the Mike Adamley Project, Rise Above. Um, when we saw how many other people were um, suffering from this and reaching out and looking for something. And, and I kid you not, you know how, you know, Mike, Mike is like all boyish joy and zest for life. He says yes to everything. And he just tackled this the same way. He said, well, if I've got to have this, then I'm going to be the one to show how to live with it. And so um, people reached out. And so we saw there's a need for this and that the hope that they got just from, supporting one another and finding out they weren't alone. And we researched what to do and we're sharing that information. And, and so that's, that's what the Mike's project is all about. Um, Sharing what we learn as we go through this and keeping people connected and supported and giving hope until they find a cure and they will find a cure. But until then 
uh, we'll just continue to, to fight on. Kim, let me ask you a question. Is the <clears throat> excuse me? Is the basic premise of the foundation recognition? Is it policy? Is it once you've got it, how do we treat it? You know, obviously, it, you know, there, I imagine it could be all of those things. But how have you spent most of your efforts to date? To date, it's been um, number one, spreading awareness about what CTE is and and sharing our story. And by doing that, it's it's um, helping other people understand what what they're experiencing and what to do. Um, and and what to do, you know, um, I mentioned how fortunate we are to be connected with um, many, many neurologists and doctors and the Concussion Legacy Foundation. Um, we're an initiative of, under them. And so we've researched what to do. Uh, and we've implemented for the past two and a half years now um, a, a bunch of lifestyle changes that are evidence-based um, shown to promote brain growth. So our, our plan was that we can't stop the damage from CTE yet. There's no cure for that. But there are things that we can do to promote brain growth to mitigate that loss. And what that does is that buys us time until they do find a cure. Uh, I'll just share with you really quickly a, a really significant statistic about Mike. Mike from uh, 2008 until the beginning of 2016, um, as MRI analyses have showed, he had lost 10 to 12 percent of his overall brain volume. And um, then we started implementing these lifestyle changes with diet and exercise and cognitive stimulation and socialization and the kind of medical treatments he was getting. And after two years, they did another MRI analysis, and it showed that Mike had no overall brain volume loss. So, so what we had done, we didn't stop the CTE. We can't do that. But he had he had grown enough brain volume, enough uh, more brain cells to offset the loss. When you're starting off with no brain cells. <laughs> <laughs> you got a lot of, it's like, it's like a, it's like Anything a startup company, right? Bonus. Yeah. It's like a startup company, 150% growth in the first year. So, <laughs> so, so <laughs> let, let me, let me ask you a question. You know, the, the, if as a listener and, a, you know, I'm really scientifically based and a lot of my time is spent doing research as well as just taking care of patients, you know, so the, 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 the listener would ask, look, even if I don't have CTE, but I have memory issues or it's in my family and things like that, you know, what do you know? What can you tell me um, that I can do and, and what's evidence-based? Like if you, if you can, if it's there, do you have sort of three or four things that you can, you know, list off? We're, we're, we're not, we don't have a lot of time, but I'm, I would be fascinated to know if you say, look, these are the things that we now know from evidence, from research that we think makes, it, makes a substantive difference in this problem. Absolutely. Uh, Mike, do you mind if I take this real fast? Absolutely. Okay. Um, well, I mentioned exercise, and Mike has always um, exercised vigorously. But what we found out is that there are certain types of exercise that are better. Um, so um, Mike would do boxing, not, not the kind where you're hitting, but the, the pattern of jabs and undercuts and all that stuff. It takes a lot of – you're not only physically engaged, but you're cognitively engaged. Um, Biking is another good one. Um, ballroom dancing, believe it or not, is one of the best physical activities you can do because it has it involves both the physical and the cognitive, where you have to think about your dancing and what you're doing, but also the social component. Um, so the physical and exercise, that's one thing. Diet and nutrition, basically a low glycemic anti-inflammatory diet with good protein is what supports the brain best. Okay. Lots of... Um, Omega threes and omega sixes and antioxidants. So we eat we eat really clean, you know, and we we eat for pleasure, but we eat really clean. We're really mi mindful of that. Learning and cognition, you know, there's all kinds of little brain games and stuff out there that you can do. But basically, the bottom line is keep growing, keep learning, keep challenging yourself, new things, take up new hobbies, keep working as long as you can. Conversation is huge. Interaction with other people is one of the best things you can do, which leads to the social component. Stay connected. One of the, the symptoms of this is that it causes um, people to go into a depression and to isolate themselves. 
And you have to stay engaged. One of the best things you can do is stay active with other people. Keep that support in place. Be part of a community. Let, let me share with you something that you made me think about when you were explaining this. When I was a uh, college student at the University of Illinois, I was my, my major was neuropsychology. And I worked with a guy who's since passed. His name was William Greeno. And I, my summer project, and you'll probably be interested in this, was so his thing was neuroplasticity, which is what you were alluding to. Neuroplasticity, obviously, as we get older, the ability for the brain to change, you know, decreases, you know, every decade of life, but you still have it. And we were looking at um, adolescent rats, and his theory was, look, if you put them in an environment with lots of stimulation, different toys and things like that, then they'd get more dendritic growth. Those are like the little roots of the, the, the nerve cells, which I'm sure you're familiar with, but I want to make sure our listeners know what we're talking about. So my thing was, I'm like, look, how do we know that they're not just running around their cage on their wheel and that's not what's causing it? And we did a study where we, instead of switching out their toys every day, we took all the toys out, but we let them just go on the, tre- on the, on the wheel, right? And we compared the relative effects of the wheel, running on a wheel, versus the constant changing of the cage with all the different toys. Do you follow me? Yes. And what we showed was that exercise had the same or more of an impact on dendritic growth than just them visually seeing all these different stimulation things in the in their cage, you know, which was fascinating. So, and that was re- that was actually my first. I probably have over a thousand publications now. That was my very first publication ever. Ironically, was on learning and cognition that had to do with separating out the effects of exercise from your environment. And since then, there's been a ton of work on that. So everything you just said, I would absolutely support, and there's tons of data to support it. So I hope our listeners get a good takeaway from what you just said. And uh, we have to wrap up. We're visiting with Kim and Mike Adamley. Um, final thoughts, Mike, on uh, your, your thoughts about football. You know, regret anything and, you know, any suggestions for you know, my kids out there, I've got 14 and 11. My 11 year old's still playing. He plays on a high level travel team. He enjoys it, but uh, it goes through our minds now when we, we see what's happened because of CTE. What are your thoughts? Well, I think, and that's one of the things the uh, Legacy Foundation, Concussion Legacy Foundation, is talking about more than anything and focusing on more than anything when it comes to football is don't let your kids play before the age of 14 and I agree with that wholeheartedly because my dad was an all-pro linebacker with the Browns and he refused to let me play peewee football because my body was not ready to do it so I think that's like the number one thing football wise I can't bash it at this certain age because it's I think it's an unfair question because it's done an awful lot for me and and how I got to be where I did and uh uh, I actually am I, I Again, I don't. I don't know if uh, it's a bad. Que- it's a tough question to ask, but that's where I stand. Just don't play when you're little. Okay, and then Kim, final thoughts and any uh, website or things you want to uh, express to the listeners? Yeah, um, you can go to uh, mikeadamley dot org. We have our initial stages of our, our website up. They can sign up uh, to for Rise Above to receive newsletters and emails from us. Uh, we are putting together a wonderful website full of resources and information uh, that goes into a lot more detail about the things that we talked about here, things that you can do and how to do them. Okay, fantastic. We wish you two the best, Mike. Uh, stay healthy, Kim, and uh, just uh, keep doing what you're doing, and uh, we're praying for you. So we uh, thank you for joining us here on Sports Medicine Weekly, Mike and Kim Adamley. Thank you so much. It's good talking to you. Yeah. Ditto. (laughs) Thanks, Michael. Take care. We are out of time, folks, so that'll do it for this edition of Sports Medicine Weekly. Many thanks to our producer, Shane Reardon. Our coordinating producer is Teresa Ann Seeger. Also want to thank David Cole for managing the website and our business operations, as well as Samantha Smith from Midwest Orthopedics at Rush. From Dr. Brian Cole, I'm Steve Cashel saying so long. Thanks for listening. Up next here on The Score... It is Inside the Clubhouse with Bruce Levine. Talk to you again next week for another edition of Sports Medicine Weekly. On 670, The Score.